So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my really good friend, uh, Tom Campbell. Um, before I knew he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I thought he was a mineral nerd. Um, he, buy, he, he was one of my first internet customers. Um, he bought rare species and all kinds of interesting things. And it turns out, I didn't even know it at the time, he is also one of the authors of the Encyclopedia of Minerals that I grew up with in the library at the Columbus, Ohio Rock and Mineral Society. Um, Tom is vastly experienced in both pegmatite mineralogy and in uh, golden ore exploration. And so I'm privileged to call him a friend and to have learned so much from him about how these things form. And after listening for so long, I finally said, you know, <laughs> you should give us all a talk on this. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Thomas Campbell. All right. It's yours. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that introduction. And... Um, you know, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't mention my, uh, my indentured servitude to, to him. So, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, in, with indentured servitude, you know, traditionally, you know, you, uh, you work for someone and you do these labors and then sometimes, you know, you'd be gifted these tracts of land, right? Well, in, in our case, um, what Rob does is that, uh, for my labors, I get uh, gifted uh, these tracts of land, but they're in these like chunks that are about three by three size, and they're, uh, they're crystalline, and they are from other countries. So there are these little tracts of land from other countries. So this is part of my indentured servitude, my, my tract of land. So I've got lots of those, right? Thank you, Rob. And, uh, but, uh, I, I did want to tell you too, so I started off the morning um, in tradition, since this is about South America, so I started the morning off with a cup of Brazilian coffee, okay? And the, uh, the coffee actually originated from a coffee plantation right adjacent to the Aruca mine in Minas Gerais, okay? And those of you who are familiar with the Aruca, that's the one that produced the, the beautiful giant kunzite crystals and the beautiful morganites. So, you know, I thought that was an appropriate way to, to start the morning. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the reason I'm here, um, it, because Rob invited me, which I am honored, Rob, thank you. And, um, you know, I love pegmatites. Uh, I love pegmatite minerals, and I really love sharing what I know about them. And um, that's, that's why I'm here. And as a preface, um, what I'd like to do is uh, start with a, a series of questions that I hope to answer uh, during the course of my presentation. And, <clears throat> boy, you really got a stretch to look up here. Um, so what are granite pegmatites and how do they form? What are the differences between a granite and its related pegmatite? What are some of the complex processes that form granite pegmatites, especially the gem-bearing ones? How old are the gem-bearing pegmatites? And what are the minerals that occur in them, especially the kinds of gem crystals? And how common are pegmatite pockets, and for us, how much of the contents gets preserved, especially over geologic time? Okay, so this is a relatively simple definition of a granite pegmatite. Um, pretty much a totally crystalline, generally very coarse-grained, uh, light-colored igneous rock derived from a, a parent granite. And it's composed mostly of quartz, feldspar, and mica. But they differ in composition from a regular granite because uh, they're enriched in potassium, lithium, rubidium, boron, fluorine, hydroxyl, and sometimes beryllium, niobium, tantalum, cesium, and tin, which provide, you know, for a lot of the other interesting minerals. And um, as you'll note um, here on this next slide, this gives you an idea of scale. Yeah, when I, when I say coarse-grained, that's a, a giant 
microcline crystal, and that's my wife for scale. And my wife is seven feet tall. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe not. Uh, for those of you who know her and met her last night, you know she's not. But the, it's a big microcline crystal, okay? And uh, the point is with pegmatites is some of the largest crystals ever found have come from a pegmatite. So if, uh, as an example, um, there's the Eta mine in Keystone, South Dakota, which some of you may have heard, heard of. Um, huge spodumene crystals, up to 14 meters long, okay? They're gigantic. And there was a, a barrel crystal from Madagascar that was 18 meters long. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that one in a bit. Okay, pegmatites supply some of the world's finest colored gemstones, such as tourmaline, topaz, aquamarine, and over 40 other uh, gem minerals. And they are a source of fabulous gem uh, minerals and crystals, as we saw in the Arkenstone Gallery last night during the reception, right? All those cases, there were a lot of pieces from um, gem pegmatites there. And these are some good representations. They're a host to a diverse suite of exotic minerals, and they're the only source of many rare minerals. And this is where I, I kind of want to take a, a little personal uh, aside here with respect to, to rare minerals. So, you know, during the course of my, my master's thesis um, on the tip top pegmatite in South Dakota, um, I worked with Bill Roberts. He was my advisor. Um, he was also my mentor, and he was like a second father to me. Um, and I don't know if any of you ever knew him, but wonderful man, excellent mineralogist. But, uh, and I was fortunate to work with him. But um, during the course of my master's work, um, they were actually actively mining the, the tip top pegmatite for burl. And so I'd go down to visit, and Bill would come with me once in a while, and we'd collect flats of material, and we were finding that the uh, burl was lined with, the, the fractures were lined with these oddball, tiny and beautiful uh, crystals. And uh, so some of them we were able to identify, you know, and we'd peer under, over the scope for hours, you know, trying to figure out what these minerals were. And, and this is the part of uh, finding and describing new minerals, which is fun and you don't hear about. So, you know, we're spending hours under the scope, we're sorting these things, wow, you know, I don't know what this is, what do you think about this, you know? And a lot of back and forth, and so we'd sort them out, you know, these unknowns. And then, um, and then I'd start to do some of the preliminary um, characterization work, like I was pretty good at wet chemistry and optical mineralogy, and I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a detente spindle stage, but it's a little stage that you, uh, it has a needle, and you actually glue a tiny crystal on the end of that needle, and you're able to determine the refractive indices of that mineral using different um, refractive index oils. So that was kind of my expertise too at the time. So, but that's almost as far as we could take it. And so then the other fun part was being able to work with other mineralogists like Pete Dunn and George Robinson, Joel Grice, and you know, you'd have these big collaborative efforts trying to characterize these new species and then you get to name them um, for someone or for the locality and tip top bite um, is an example for the tip top pegmatite and it's a really complex um, potassium, sodium, lithium, beryllo phosphate. And uh, it's, it's beautiful too as you can see here. You know, if these things were 10 times the size, they would be in demand, right? but they're, you know, millimeters. But anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd share that uh, part of it with you. And uh, as far as chemical composition, uh, bulk composition is very similar to that of a granite. Um, they have a higher aluminum content, lower calcium content compared to a granite. Um, the rare element and uh, myarolytic pegmatites, again, they're often enriched in lithium, beryllium, boron, fluorine, rubidium, cesium, and phosphorus, which is important for us as far as the, the gem minerals are concerned and for economic mining of pegmatites. And for an example here, um, for one of the unusual um, minerals, this is a pellucite from my collection from Afghanistan. And um, it's a, essentially the cesium analog of an alcene. So it's, uh, 
interesting, and we'll look at uh, quite a few minerals during the course of this. So the relationship to granites, um, they can be direct products of igneous fractionation from granitic melts, essentially offspring of these uh, granite parents, and others might be, uh, they might have an affinity uh, to uh, metamorphic anatexas, and um, no pun intended there, anatexas. Um, anyway, um, so they're in metamorphic rocks and they get uh, heated up to a certain temperature and pressure that they start to melt and then they start to recrystallize, right? And so those are something different compared to our uh, fractionated our, uh, granites and fractionated pegmatites. And this, uh, these two diagrams really show that relationship to the granite. So we have the granite pluton at the base in both of these um, diagrams. And then what happens is you have this silicate melt that's rich in uh, what we call the rare elements that I've just mentioned. These are not rare earth elements, these are rare elements. Um, there's, they're totally different. Um, and then volatiles, right? So you have this melt that's rich in volatiles and these rare elements, and they're light and they're buoyant, and they uh, rise up through the granitic body, and then they can also rise up into the country rock. And they can crystallize along the margin of the, uh, of the parent granite, and they can make their way, they actually muscle themselves up through the uh, surrounding country rock because they are buoyant, right? And they're uh, less dense. And they uh, follow the path of least resistance up. And so, you know, you get these swarms of pegmatites around these granites. And uh, the shallow or myrolytic pegmatites can be located internally or externally with respect to the parent granite. The rare element pegmatites are distributed around the parent granite within the associated metamorphic rocks. And then this next slide kind of reiterates that. The uh, rare element pegmatites are zoned around their parent granite and swarms. And so uh, just like that uh, diagram, last diagram that was on the right. So they often term that a pegmatite field, okay? And when you're in Brazil, in the northern Brazilian pegmatite province, you have a lot of these granite bodies, and they do. They have all these pegmatite satellites. Um, around them. Same with the Black Hills pegmatites. You have the Harney Peak granite, which is the central granite, and then you have this bullseye of um, these fractionated pegmatites um, around the Harney Peak granite. The same thing happens in uh, California, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan with those pegmatites. Same, same relationship. And uh, the most compelling argument for their genetic link is supported by uh, geochemistry because uh, the parent granite will have a certain geochemical fingerprint and it will pass that on to the granite or to the pegmatite. Okay, so there's that link, and then you can age date them. Okay, so you um, age date the parent granite and then you age date the pegmatites and you find out the pegmatites are just slightly younger than the parent granite. So as far as shape and size is concerned, um, they're highly variable. Uh, factors affecting the shape and size include uh, their depth of emplacement, type of host rock, the structure of the host rock, and differences in lithostatic versus hydrostatic pressure. And um, let me kind of go through this a little bit, just so, because this is kind of important for you to understand. So with respect to the ones that are formed at depth, higher temperature pressure conditions, um, those form in an area that us geologists like to term um, the ductile brittle regime, where the rock is more plastic. And so when the pegmatites get intruded to those, they tend to follow foliation, and they're, uh, they're kind of distorted elliptical shapes, they're bulbous masses, maybe inverted teardrops. And then um, the others, when they get emplaced into higher levels of the crust, where uh, it's lower temperature and pressure, um, the regime is more brittle, and it is. It's the brittle regime in the crust. So um, there's fractures, there's faults, and the pegmatites, uh, pegmatite melts follow those fractures and faults, and that's why they're more dike-like and have those planar contacts. So that's, that's to explain the, the structural relationship to their shape, okay? 
Um, the other uh, part of it is that, um, you know, you can find a variety of shapes and sizes within any, within any pegmatite field, okay? Doesn't matter where it is in the world. And this is an example of size. So if we look at the um, cross sections on the left, this is of the uh, Tanco pegmatite in Bernick Lake, Manitoba. And I spent a little bit of time there um, years ago. Uh, but it, it is such a cool pegmatite. This thing is huge. It's a kilometer and a half long. It's over a half a kilometer wide and it's 100 meters deep, okay, thick. It's huge. It's been mined for decades, and it will probably be mined for another at least couple decades, right? Huge source of uh, cesium, as well as uh, beryllium, some tantalum minerals too, and uh, a lot of other oddball elements. And in contrast, the, uh, the photo on the right is of the Helen Burrell pegmatite, and what you see there for the outcrop is uh, actually the, in, the entire um, outer portion of the, the pegmatite, okay? And so you're seeing in this case, this is one of those pegmatites where it was formed deeper, a plas plastic in environment, right? Br uh, ductile brittle, and it's an inverted teardrop. And so you're seeing the whole thing here, well, almost the whole thing because they, they mined out the intermediate zone and core, and you know, I could get you all excited and say, no, it was actually all crystals, right? But that's, that's not the case. But um, you get the idea there in terms of the difference in shapes. Okay, and then during the, um, the Second World War, when there was a real demand for these rare elements, or strategic elements, as they called them then and still do, um, there were people like um, Cameron, Johns, Redden, Norton, and, and many others who pioneered um, the mapping and the investigations of pegmatites in the United States and in Brazil. Um, pegmatites in the United States and, and Brazil were both being mined for the uh, war effort in the Second World War. So anyway, um, uh, further research was done in the 80s by Vlasov and uh, Ginsburg, and they started, they, they took the information from these early workers who did phenomenal work, and they, they tried to make a classification of pegmatites. And any subsequent uh, classification has um, really continued on with, uh, with what they did. And just basically, uh, how they classify them is depth of formation, um, their mineralogy, and their, their internal structure. So whether they, were, they have zones or uh, fracture filling units, things like that, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So that's really what this uh, classification is based on. And this is a, a, a very simplified classification from uh, London, 2008. And the, the point that I wanna make here is these are the, the deep pegmatites, the abyssal ones that really just have mostly muscovite, maybe a little burl, but all of the crystals that we might be interested in, they're all massive and they're all frozen in the, uh, in the pegmatite itself, right? There's really, there's no pockets. It's too deep. Um, and then as you go uh, toward the surface, then you get the rare element pegmatites with the burl, the spodumene, uh, pellucite, um, and whatnot. And then closer to the surface, you get the muralytic pegmatites that have the big pockets and the gem crystals, okay? So the correlation here is deep, no pockets. Shallow, pockets. We want shallow, right? We want the pockets. So um, to reiterate that, depth is important in regarding the ability to form pockets. And so it's like, do we want the one on the left or do we want the one on the right? I'm going with the one on the right, right? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about incompatible elements. So uh, one group of elements that uh, we find in pegmatites, uh, some of them anyway, are large ion lithophile elements, also called lilies. And um, that's like cesium, rubidium, barium, lead, and strontium. 
And then, uh, and they're characterized by large size, low charge, okay? And then you have the high field strength elements like tantalum, niobium, phosphorus, zirconium, and uranium for our purposes. And they're small, and they have a high charge, okay? And you might see where I'm going with this in terms of forming crystals. Um, and then uh, it was kind of neat, um, Simmons and, um, and also uh, London liked the term pegmatophile elements for lithium, beryllium, and boron, and that's very appropriate. And those tend to be small too. And so I got a couple of props here. So this would be like a cesium atom, okay? Big, maybe uh, you know, with a low charge, plus one, right? And then, then you have this little one, and this could be lithium, boron, beryllium, whatever, but it's tiny, right? And the, the point is that because of their size differences and their charges, they don't fit very easily into common rock forming mineral uh, structures, right? You know, like feldspars, like the microcline feldspars, or the micas, or quartz for that matter, right? So these, these get segregated off. These are the elements that go into that fractionated part of that granitic melt because they don't fit, right? And so along with the volatiles and these incompatible elements, they get enriched in that melt. And that's what we like to see, right? So as an example, I included here a, a, a wogenite piece from my collection. And uh, it's from Brazil. And uh, the interesting thing about this, if you're not familiar with it, it's a manganese tin tantalum oxide. Okay, I just find that fascinating. I, I love that combination of chemistry with the, the mineral, right? And because of all these incompatible elements and the volatiles, um, it, it's kind of fun. Um, Rob coined the term, while we were working on, on my presentation while I was reviewing it, pegmatite soup, <laughs> right? And it's, it, isn't that appropriate? I mean, you have this, this volatile uh, and incompatible rich melt, and that's the basis of forming our pockets in these awesome pegmatites. So yeah, we've got these great minerals, and uh, yeah, I know, I got creative one night and just, <laughs> kind of went to town on a Campbell's soup can, how appropriate, right? And, uh, and, and by the way, Rob and I have commissioned Campbell's to make this soup, and every 500th can has a, a three-inch aquamarine in it. <laughs> yeah, not really. Okay, as far as this uh, pegmatite soup goes, though, it is, it's responsible for the, this huge variety of minerals in, in pegmatites, the gem minerals in particular. So I'm not going to go through all these, but like for beryl, we have aquamarine, you know, the blue variety, or blue-green, goshenite, colorless, heliodor, yellow, morganite, uh, pink. And then we have topaz, the tourmaline group, um, you know, the pink and the green tourmalines in particular, uh, spessartine garnet, you know, the beautiful orange garnets, the rich in manganese, um, spodumene, you have the gem variety, kunzite, and then in this list here from Simmons, he included a bunch of interesting minerals that you may or may not be familiar with, some of you, but Brazilianite, chrysoberyl, danborite, euclase, hamburgite, um, petalite, pizzotaite, phenakite, okay? So um, great chemistry associated with these, right? And the other thing that's kind of neat is the uh, trace elements that add the variety to, to the, uh, the colors in these variations of minerals, right? So you have MN2+, which is responsible for the pink color in morganite and for the pink color in, in rubellite. And then Fe3+, it adds the green color, especially to the, the green varieties of uh, uh, tourmaline. And then Cu2+, of course, that adds the color to uh, the Periba tourmaline. So, uh, and, and I'll refer you to um, George Rossman's talk from a symposium in 2011 where he talks about the color of, uh, cause of color in minerals. It's a great talk. So here's this fractionation concentration topic again. And what I want to do here is really talk about the uh, little box over to the right. So that's the, um, 
starting amounts of these um, certain rare elements in the granite itself. And you can see lithium's at 57, cesium and beryllium are at four, and that's parts per million, okay? So when it gets fractionated, take a look at that box in the upper left. Lithium, look at the difference. Um, 3,450 parts per million lithium in the fractionated uh, pegmatite portion of that melt. Cesium, 2,600 parts per million compared to four. Uh, beryllium, 170 compared to four. So tremendous amount of uh, enrichment during the fractionation process. And then uh, we have the uh, volatile enrichment, and these volatiles include water, fluorine, chlorine, carbonate, borate, um, the lithium ion, and, and phosphorus, or phosphate. And I'll let you read that part, but uh, you know, what this does is it really facilitates um, the processes that are in the pegmatite or in the pocket. And um, so what happens is, okay, it inhibits nucleation. What's that mean? Well, it, it uh, limits the number of sites that a crystal can form, whether it's in the pegmatite or in a pocket, right? And so instead of having maybe thousands of places for crystals to grow and you might get small crystals, you might only get scores or maybe a hundred sites where crystals will form. And the viscosity is lowered by these, so the fluid is thinner. So instead of being like molasses, it might be more like maple syrup, okay? And it increases the diffusion rates, so these ions can move around and move through large distances much easier, right? And that's why we get the giant crystals, and that's why, too, why we get the gem crystals. And we see in a pocket where that entire pocket isn't covered in tourmaline, right? It's only certain areas in that pocket that have sprays of tourmaline crystals or single crystals of tourmaline, and it's because of, of the volatiles. So they serve as fluxes and they assist in the formation of gem pockets. And to give you an idea of size again, um, this is a series of beryl crystals. This is an old picture um, by J.C. Perham um, of huge beryl crystals from the Bumpus Quarry in, uh, in Maine. And here we're back to that 18 meter uh, beryl crystal in Madagascar. Yeah, it's 18 meters long. It was three and a half meters in diameter, and it weighed 419 tons. That is the largest crystal of any kind in the world, okay? And it's from a pegmatite. So, role of volatiles again. Uh, volatiles dissolve from a melt by fractional crystallization. Uh, granite melts can contain up to 12.5% water. Didn't know if you knew that or not, but that's, that's quite a bit of water for a uh, um, a silicate magma, or any magma. And um, they, uh, the volatiles lower the point at which minerals crystallize, so maybe if they typically crystallize at 650 degrees centigrade, those volatiles actually lower that crystallization temperature to anywhere from like 450, 400, maybe even 350 degrees centigrade or lower. Um, they're responsible for forming um, gem bearing, primary pockets, myrolytic cavities, and giant crystals. They're uh, unfortunately also responsible for the corrosion and alteration of these primary pockets in their minerals, okay? So there, is a, a, there could be a, a detrimental side here. Um, with respect to um, rates of crystallization, this is, uh, this is kind of interesting. So within the last 10 years, um, people like Dave London, Skip Simmons, Karen Weber, they've done a lot of research uh, in terms of how long does it take a, a pegmatite to crystallize, right? And I don't know about some of you, but um, you know, I go back to the period where 30 years ago, uh, I was still being taught that, oh, pegmatites, you know, coarse grain size, they must take you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of years to cool to get crystals that large, right? Nope. That's not the thinking now, based on their research that they've been doing. And check out, my, my two Bibles are the books by uh, Skip Simmons and others and, and Dave London. And 
check those books out. It's really interesting to, to read some of uh, what they have to say in terms of uh, how long these things crystallize. And it kind of makes sense. So uh, with respect to um, maybe the smaller pegmatites, the pegmatite dikes like in Himalaya dike system, maybe only days, days to weeks. Whereas the larger pegmatites, um, like the ones in Brazil, the ones in South Dakota, uh, these bigger bulbous masses, the Tanco pegmatite too, for example, they may take hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years to form, right? Much larger um, and they uh, have a higher heat capacity. Okay, pegmatite anatomy. Um, simple pegmatites, really just what they say. They're unzoned, pretty much sub-economic, really just contain muscovite, quartz, feldspar, and um, maybe, maybe they're mined for um, you know, ceramics back in the day or like isinglass from the, uh, from the muscovite, the big sheets of muscovite. Um, most shallow through intermediate pegmatites exhibit some kind of in internal structure, and this can be uh, subdivided into zones replacement units, and fracture fillings. And um, we'll get into those in a minute. And I just thought I'd show you in this diagram, this is a great diagram modified by Cameron. Um, so on the outside, you have the border zone, and that's what's in contact with the country rock. It crystallizes quickly and first. And then you have the wall zone, and then you have the intermediate zone, which could, could be subdivided, like into the outer and the inner intermediate zone, and then you have the core, okay? And so these zones, they are um, concentric shells uh, throughout the pegmatite, and they can be complete or incomplete. They don't have to go uh, all the way around the pegmatite. And then you have the fracture fillings, which are cross-cutting uh, conformable open space fillings that uh, they do. They just fill the fractures that form in the pegmatite, maybe as the pegmatite cools, and it creates these cooling fractures. And, um, and same with the, the replacement bodies. So with the replacement bodies, um, you really have diffusion of fluids and uh, elements out into the pegmatite, maybe originating from the, the core or the intermediate zone core area. And they alter the, the pre-existing minerals that had crystallized. So, but the interesting thing here for us with respect to the gem minerals and trying to understand pegmatites, so the, the liquid that's forming toward the end, so say the, the wall zone, border zone's already crystallized, intermediate zone's starting to, to crystallize, and you get a fracture. That fluid that comes from the core, where it's kind of a, a melt mush thing, um, will squirt into these fractures, right? And it'll cross cut previously existing and previously crystallized zones. So you'll get an assemblage in there of minerals that crystallize that's totally different from the, the zone that's hosting it, right? And so that could be a good thing too because you can get all kinds of oddball minerals forming in those. And then same with the replacement bodies. Um, th those can actually kind of wreak havoc on uh, the pre-existing pockets in terms of alteration and whatnot. Okay, complex pegmatites, zoned, have fracture filling or replacement units, have elevated concentrations of boron, lithium, phosphorus, fluorine, and water, along with beryllium, tantalum, niobium, cesium, and tin. They're uh, formed from highly evolved, volatile-rich melts that produce pockets lined with gorgeous gem crystals that we like. So that's just kind of a, a summary there. Now I'm gonna get into kind of some facts and observations about um, mirolytic pegmatites. They form between about a little less than a kilometer and a half and um, three and a half kilometers below the surface, characterized by having pockets or cavities in gem crystals. There are pods of pegmatite or pegmatite dikes located in the upper parts of parent granites and in adjacent host rocks. They have cavities that commonly contain gem crystals of quartz, beryl, tourmaline, topaz, along with feldspars, layer silicates, and many other bizarre species. And this diagram to the right there, uh, you know, since this is a diagram, you can, uh, I mean, it's uh, of feldspars, quartz, and tourmaline, but if you've got any other favorites you want to throw in there, do it, because this is just a diagram, right? So throw, throw any of your favorite minerals in there. 
Okay, as far as the mineralogy is concerned, I'm just gonna kind of jump right into this. Um, mostly silicates, phosphates, and oxides, they're the most abundant. And we've already talked about quartz, microcline, feldspar, albite, and muscovite as being the most common silicates. And then of course we get to the ones that we love, uh, spodumene, beryl, topaz, and garnet or can also be common. So let's look at some cool minerals. Um, we'll start with a piece on the, on the left real quickly. Um, this is a really nice spessartine with albite um, from Pakistan and this is uh, from my wife's collection. She collects garnets exclusively. And uh, the one in the middle is spectacular. It's uh, albite on, a, on a, a big ball of albite from the Cruzeiro mine. And you know, I forgot to ask Rob the size of this, and if you notice up there, I just put big. Um, but it is, it's about, it's about that big, and it's a gorgeous piece. And then the, uh, the one on the far right is a, a petalite crystal, which uh, originated from uh, Dick Gaines's collection. And uh, I knew him pretty well too. He's a good friend, amazing mineralogist, traveled all over the world studying pegmatites. Great guy. Um, some more silicates. Um, we have uh, Heliodor from the Ukraine on the left, followed by uh, aquamarine from Brazil, and then a nice topaz on albite there on the right. And then as far as the oxides are concerned, there are a lot of oddballs here too. So uh, they can include the columbite, tantalite group, um, wogenite, cassiterite, ixialite, uraninite, chrysoberyl. And to the left is an example of uh, twin cassiterite on uh, albite from Brazil. And then in the center is that gorgeous um, chrysoberyl uh, six-ling twin. Um, beautiful piece. And then on the right, um, it's another wogenite crystal, and I actually just picked that up on my last um, trip to Brazil. And then we have the phosphates, um, and most of these are actually the primary phosphates, so they can occur uh, during the crystallization, um, like of the intermediate zone in these more complex pegmatites, and you can get, uh, you can get fluorapatite, triphylite, lithiophyllite, cyclorite, amblygonite, monobrasite, and then late stage alteration products of these two as in the secondary phosphate minerals like I, I talked about at the beginning of the talk. And um, here on the left we have uh, fluorapatite on uh, albite with a little bit of uh, albite tourmaline from Brazil from the Golconda mine. And on the right, um, I, I, I love this piece. I got this from, uh, this is originally from Steve Smale's collection and it's a monobrasite um, from uh, Brazil. And the halides, of course, we can get fluorite in pegmatites. And the one on the left is uh, fluorite with uh, shoral from Stocknala. And then the one on the right, this is uh, uh, another one. You don't want to say this one three times fast. It's uh, a combination. Uh, both minerals are in there, but it's behierite uh, and skiavinatoite. And they are either the tantalum niobate or tantalum borate or uh, niobium borate. And yes, believe it or not, you can get zeolites in pegmatites. You know, you don't always think of that, right? And you don't hear much about it, um, but they come out. And you know, it's, it's interesting because we don't see many of them, and I think a lot of it is because when the miners are in there, they see these white lumps, and they just toss them aside. You know, it's not important to them. It's not an aquamarine, or it's not a kunzite, right? And, but sometimes they do trickle out, but it's interesting because they are indicators of very late stages of uh, crystallization products in a pegmatite, right? And, and why not? You know, they contain sodium, calcium, potassium, and other cations, and they're aluminosilicates and they're hydrated, right? So why not find them in, um, in these pockets in, at late stages? And maybe even at much later hydrothermal or even um, uh, meteoric waters interacting on the pegmatite at a later stage. <clears throat> as far as gem pockets, um, residual melt accumulates at low density and it exalts these uh, rare elements. The pegmatites crystallize from contact to core. Primary pockets are one of the last 
features to form in a pegmatite. And of course, they're the most important as far as uh, producers of gem minerals. And for size, they can be a few centimeters in size or they can be meters in dimension, okay? They can be huge. And they're found generally at the contact between the intermediate zone and the core or in the core itself. And the pockets are abundant in shallow pegmatites, but they are absent in the deeper, higher pressure environments like we talked about already. Um, gem pockets, just real quick, um, they can preserve, get preserved by uh, pocket clay, which can be a late stage feature in the, the pegmatite where everything's crystallized and the only thing left is a gel. And that gel crystallizes maybe uh, usually into kaolinite. And so it can pre preserve the pocket or maybe there's pocket rupture and the, uh, the crystals are in there, kind of like this, still kind of maybe on the floor or whatever, but the clay will come in later and it will at least um, preserve them in place as they are um, and help keep that, uh, help keep them protected. <clears throat> They're most common in complex pegmatites, but rare. Pocket-bearing pegmatites may be pervasive in some pegmatite regions like in Brazil, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Southern California, but cavities are still rare. Pockets containing gem tourmaline, aquamarine, kunzite, and topaz, even more rare. And pockets in rare, uh, pockets are rare and pockets containing preserved gem crystals are a miracle. And talk about miracles. Um, this is a great artist rendition by Wendell Wilson that uh, he uh, put together and he actually took and obtained as much information as he could about the Jonas pocket to uh, essentially reconstruct this. And the part of this that I find interesting is that you know those processes with respect to the volatiles earlier, how it uh, inhibits nucleation sites, um, promotes uh, diffusion and the growth of crystals. Well, I can see that happening right here. You can tell that there were just limited number of nucleation sites and those big tourmalines formed at those places. And then there's a beautiful elbite from the Jonas mine from Jeff Kramer's collection. Um, just some facts here in terms of occurrence of gem crystals too. Um, pocket distribution in pegmatites is erratic and their location can be very difficult to almost impossible to predict. They vary in size and shape with pegmatite, so there's no relationship between the size of the pegmatite to the size and shape or the number of pockets. And the mineralogy of one pocket to another can vary significantly within one pegmatite. This is a, a large twinned ambligonite crystal from Brazil. Uh, currents of gem crystals. With respect to this diagram, um, what I really want to show you here is that um, this is kind of a typical pocket. This is a reconstruction in the Denver Museum, but kind of a typical pocket, kind of elliptical shape that would be found like in one of those inverted teardrop shaped pegmatites, whereas the one below is typical of a Himalaya dike where you know you have the uh, hanging wall contact, the foot wall contact, and the pegmatite in between. And then you have what's known as the, uh, the median line or the pocket line where pockets tend to occur more commonly. Um, pockets are almost dominated by the feldspars and micas, and they're the ones that are rooted in the, po in the pocket uh, margins, right? And then subsequently, or maybe contemporaneously, you get beryl, tourmaline, and other minerals growing in there with it in the pocket. And these various mineral species are able to grow into the pocket space and produce well-formed crystals um, often with uh, complex pyrogenesis, depending on the uh, uh, pocket chemistry. And pocket crystals are distributed non-uniformly within the pockets, like we saw within the Jonas diagram. And the diagram on the left kind of illustrates that with the uh, um, feldspars and the quartz being rooted at the, in the base of the pocket and then the, um, the gem crystals being in there, and Carl Warning was nice enough to let me use as a photo of this just gorgeous um, tourmaline from Stocknala that he has, and this, uh, when it came through onto the PowerPoint, it really doesn't do justice to the colors, it's just a gorgeous piece. 
So potential de demise of gem crystals. Um, just real quickly, when a pocket rupture occurs, you know, you can get um, this high fluid pressure that causes it to rupture, and you can have other fluids come into that pocket and corrode the minerals that are in there. And as an example, um, beryl can completely alter to a variety of mineral species, like in this case, maybe bertrandite, euclase, phenakite, bavanite, um, depending on the chemistry. And what that does, uh, th some of the good things, is that when the, when the beryl alters in this case, you can form some fabulous uh, specimens like this uh, snow, big snowflake uh, beryllinite on this doubly terminated um, hydroxyl herderite from Pakistan. And then the other thing that it can do too, it can create pseudomorphs. So in the case of the uh, elbaite on the left there, it's been completely replaced by these late stage fluids and so you have lipidolite after elbaite. This is something that you might find interesting. Pegmatites range in age between less than 35 million years up to 3.5 billion years, okay? These are gem pocket pegmatite ages. So to give you some examples, Afghani Pakistani pegmatites, they're about 35 million years old. California pegmatites, about 100 million years old. Orongo pegmatites in Namibia, 130 million years old. And to put that in perspective, next time you see an Orongo aqua, whether it's in somebody's collection, your own collection, or in the Arkenstone Gallery, yeah. This crystal is 130 million years old, okay? Just a little different perspective. Chinese pegmatites, 220 million years old. The Brazilian pegmatites, 500 million years old. And the Ukrainian and Black Hills pegmatites, 1.7 billion years old. And then I brought one more piece. The Tanco pegmatite, 2.6 billion years old. This crystal, this barrel crystal cluster, 2.6 billion years old. So I think it adds another dimension for you maybe when you're looking at at least the, the gem crystals from pegmatites from various localities. Gem pocket statistics. Less than 1% of all pegmatites are um, myrolytic. Less than 1% of those contain gem crystals. And less than 1% of the gem crystal uh, pockets survive intact. This is uh, with respect to pocket location and specimen extraction. Got to do geologic mapping as much as you can. Look at textural indicators, uh, mineralogy, um, whether it's looking at lipidolite, blue albite, clevelandite, uh, changes in matrix tourmaline. And here's some examples of pocket preservation and extraction. I'm not going to um, put too much time on these. Beautiful tourmalines in the center and on the, the left and then um, on the right. Rob has this piece, it's a herderite on topaz from the Shanda mine. And he, these, I, I don't know if you saw these last night, but th these are just two gorgeous tourmalines Rob has um, in the case in the Arkenstone. The, the one on the left is from the Chia mine, um, just artistic and just amazing. And same with the one on the right the Cruzero mine, um, amazing pieces. And then uh, Kevin Brown, let me use a, a photo of his Dutton mine um, tourmaline on the left, gorgeous piece. And then this complex um, kunzite morganite specimen from Afghanistan. So long and torturous life of a gem crystal. Um, they have to, uh, the pocket has to outlast the pegmatite and the pocket forming process, right? It has to survive any late stage e equilibration, fracturing, and fluid. So pocket rupture, etching, dissolution, alteration. And then it's the waiting process. Will it outlast geologic time? Okay, they're sitting in the crust for 300 million years, 2.6 billion years, whatever. You know, are those pockets gonna survive between then and now? right, given all the processes that could affect it. And then will it survive pocket discovery and ex extraction? Quick story, I went to Brazil one time, went down in a, 
um, well, I'll show you here. Went down in a family-owned pegmatite, little six by six dog hole, go down the bottom, they're all excited. They have all these, they found all these tourmaline crystals here in that corner, in the corner photo. And um, so I'm kind of excited maybe to see what's down there. And I see this empty pocket and instead of extracting them slowly with uh, maybe a diamond chainsaw or whatever, you're gonna cringe. They rake them out with a shovel and other tools. And this happens, it, it happens a lot. We're trying to educate them, like, you know, do you want the value of your pocket to be $100,000 or do you want it to be $5 million, right? That's, and th their jaw dropped, right? So, and, and that's the thing we, st we still deal with. But anyway, these uh, pegmatite adventures are fantastic. And then, yeah, this is the proper way to, uh, extract the, the nice specimens is um, using the diamond chainsaw as a more advanced material. Um, as far as those responsible for po pocket uh, extraction and beautiful crystals, um, I, I have to include a few of these folks. Of course, you'll recognize Bill Larson uh, down there in the lower right in all his efforts in California for his uh, specimen pre preservation. And Jill Armando, a wonderful friend of mine in Brazil. Uh, his family owns the Uruca mine and the Itachia mine. And then uh, Ramiro, um, he's like my Brazilian uncle. Wonderful guy, I've known him for 10 years. He and I, I know a little bit of Portuguese. He doesn't know a lick of English. But when we get together, we talk. And with gestures and everything, we have a great conversation. Wonderful people. So, in summary, to answer those questions, gem bearing and rare element pegmatites are fractionated products of apparent granite. They're enriched in incompatible elements and volatiles that enable the formation of giant crystals as well as pockets and gem crystals, assuming they're emplaced at shallow levels. Gem bearing pegmatites can be less than 35 million years up to 3.5 billion years old. They have diverse mineralogy from sulfides to silicates and everything in between. Pegmatite pockets are rare, and finding a pocket mostly intact is a miracle. And finding and extracting gem crystals from a pocket for collectors is an art. And I just want to end this with uh, a comment from me. Granted, pegmatites are an intriguing rock type, mineral deposits that represent an unusual combination of common and rare elements that combine to form diverse and beautiful mineral assemblages with complex pyrogenesis. I study and collect pegmatite minerals for these reasons and because to me their artistry is manifest, manifested in many different ways, not just in their outward appearance. And then of course it's for all the people that I have met and continue to meet along the way. Thank you. Good job. Take my hand. I will. Good job. Thanks, Rob.